And why are these people in the United States? And, well, one of the reasons is that there's this enormous pressure on the, the, these agencies that bring them in. They want they, Refugees are their business, and they want them. Um, so that's, that's part of the answer. And, you know, why was this non-obvious thing? So in, uh, now, the question of, we're talking about Syrian refugees. Um, the, uh, so, so security is obviously a high, high priority topic. So I'll start with an, at my editorial. Well, what am I talking about? Next, please. Um, so I'm going to make a sidetrack to just the workings, the, the misworkings of our immigration system, in quotes, or wh whatever you call it, these arrangements, uh, this, this mess. Uh, the example being uh, 1986 is the, the original amnesty of illegal aliens, IRCA, Immigration Reform and Control Act. Uh, there were several million illegal aliens in the country, you know, estimates, you can't know for sure, but several million thought to be in the country. And it was about expected that about a million would qualify to get legal status, get amnesty. And they called it amnesty back then. There wasn't any argument about what, what, what the term was. It was amnesty. Well, one million expected, 2.7 million actually legalized. Next, please. About, uh, among which about 30% were fraudulent. And um, so next, please. I'm going to details about the, the fraud. <clears throat> the amnesty consisted of two parts. And the part we'll talk about is the special agricultural worker component of the 1986 amnesty. If you were here in the U.S. at the time the bill passed, and uh, you'd worked in agriculture for, I think, 90 days in each of the two preceding years, then you qualified for the uh, special agricultural worker amnesty. Uh, but you'd be interviewed. Next, please, Jerry. You'd be interviewed by INS agents to vet, to use the cur current terminology, to vet your agricultural experience. You know, you actually worked in agriculture? Okay, well, you know, tell us what you did. You know, what did you do to work in a given day? Well, next, please. They had the agents were told things like, oh, legal status granted to people who, next, please. Uh, they told tales about picking strawberries from the tops of strawberry trees <laughs> after, picking up the, after setting up their ladders, or digging up cherries from the ground. And yet, people who told these tales would get would get amnesty. Now, I don't know that they all got amnesty, but 800,000 are estimated to be fraudulent. Uh, next, please. And then there's the story of Mahmoud Abu Halima. I wonder if anyone else, does anyone else in the room know that name? Okay. Well, he was an illegal alien from Egypt. Uh, he was in the U.S. at least by the mid-1980s. He drove taxi cabs badly in New York. He had many driving violations. He applied for the 1986 amnesty as a special agricultural worker, and he got it. <clears throat> and then in 1993, he was one of the principals in the bombing of the, of the World Trade Center, the first attack in the World Trade Center. And today he resides in the uh, federal supermax uh, prison in Florence, Colorado. But anyway, it's just an ex I call him, I consider him the poster child for the 1986 amnesty, for the dysfunction of these things when, once they actually do them. Next, please, Jerry. So why did these things fail? Why did IRCA fail? And why will any of these other programs fail? Next, please. It's partly because the, the numbers overwhelm the bureaucracy. You've got this huge press of people, and they just got to so basically wave them, wave them through. You know, they've, they've got these rules, but they ignore them because there's just too much press of numbers. Next, please. And, and the incentives are always to get to yes. I mean, you got the people who are applying who want to get amnesty in this case. Maybe, maybe they've got relatives who are here legally and they want their relatives to get amnesty, their illegal alien relatives to get amnesty. You got the, the employers who want to keep their cheap labor. And you've also got the people working in the, in the bureaucracy, which is nowadays is U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, we're going to hold questions till the end. Try to remember it. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you have to save it for later. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are we stuck here? No. You're doing great. Okay. Um, so, uh, so if you're in the bureaucracy, you know you got you know you got unhappy people unless you say yes. So that's an inducement to say yes. And you got your supervisor leaning on you because people are leaning on him. Say yes. And so as columnist Michelle Malkin says. It ain't over till the alien wins. It's never over till the alien wins. 
and then to summarize external pressures on the bureaucracy, the, the businesses that want cheap labor, and that is a really major, uh, re really major component. And the ethnic lobbies who want more co-ethnics, like the, the National Council of La Raza, which would certainly uh, favor legalizing every single Hispanic illegal alien in the country. And I've emphasized the uh, businesses want, want cheap labor, won't we'll come back to that one, one more round in a little, little bit. Next, please. So, um, so we have the IRCA amnesty, and then there have actually been six May, uh, mass amnesties since IRCA that aggregate to more than IRCA itself did. So we're talking about seven or eight million amnestied and mass amnesties. Plus there's always an everyday one, onesies, twosies amnesties of particular cases of people who are here legally, get, their status gets laundered to legal. And yet we've got like 11 or 10, 10 or 11 million illegal aliens in the country now after doing all that. So why would we keep doing it? And then the point is, well, you know, who believes the system is going to work better with Syrian refugees? Next, please. This is uh, Michael Steinbeck, Assistant Director of the FBI, and in February of last year, he testified before the House Homeland Security Committee. Uh, next, please. And we're not going to read this whole thing, uh, but you can go back to it and if you look at the file later. Um, a quote from an, an article, and the point of it is that <clears throat> We don't have any data on these people. There's, there's no way we can vet these people. I mean, it's just completely a fantasy. No matter how many months you, you put, in, put in, you're just not going to have any information on them. Uh, next, please. And then uh, FBI director himself, James Comey, who has been in the news recently with uh, <clears throat> renown over uh, Hillary Clinton's emails, um, last October, um, he said essentially the same thing to the same committee in the House of Representatives. And I just focus here on these, word, these words that are kind of uh, uh, flamboyant. We can query our databases until the cows come home, but nothing will show up because we have no record of, the, of that person. You can only query what you have collected. Next, please. Okay, what about refugees in Oregon? Refugee arrivals. Uh, we're talking about arrivals because that's the only way the, the numbers are kept. Uh, well, that's what you keep track of. Again, once they're here, they can move anywhere they want. Here is a web page which you can get to, which allows you to put in, you know, I chose date uh, October 1st, 2001, and the ending date just a few days ago, and I put in Oregon for arrivals here, and I put in all of the different, uh, all, all ethnicities, all countries of origin, and I hit return. Next, please. Uh, and you don't need uh, login or registration or password or anything like that. You can just use it. Next, please. So refugee arrivals in, in Oregon, uh, this is the first page of nine. Next, please. Uh, so this is this is one page one of nine. Uh, next, uh, it's alphabetical by country of origin, so it starts with Afghanistan, and then it's alphabetical by settlement city. So under Afghanistan, we have um, let's see, um, Aloha, Oregon, then Beaverton, uh, Portland, and uh, the, 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 I forget what the last one is. And there's something like 200 uh, Afghans came to came to Oregon from Afghanistan over that time period. Uh, next, please. And the Oregon total for all nationalities in all settlement cities over that time is 13,605 out of about, about 846,000 uh, arrivals in the U.S. entirely from, uh, among refugees. And uh, Oregon is punching a little bit above its weight in its proportion of the national population. This is somewhat higher proportion than, than Oregon's proportion of the national, you know, just American population. Um, you can download this in, in more convenient formats than I've shown here. Uh, next, please. And a quick uh, rundown of some examples of uh, countries of origin. Burma, 1824, over that time period, 1824 arrivals. They, they not, may not still be here, but they, came, they started in Oregon. Iraq, 1483, well, we've got some responsibility for Iraq. We can maybe understand that. But what about Moldova in Eastern Europe? Or Ukraine, why 3,100 from the Ukraine? Um, a, co a correspondent of mine in the audience may be able to tell us uh, what's going on there in uh, um, <clears throat> during the discussion section. Uh, but I'm gonna, I need to rush on. Next, please. Oh, and the total arrivals in Salem during that period, about 300, including about 170 from Ukraine. Next, please. The state does have a refugee coordinator. This is up-to-date information. I took this information from Ann Corcoran's website. We'll get to Ann Corcoran quickly. The, this is out of date for the refugee health coordinator, but I presume that there is some successor. This is the Office of Regional, excuse me, Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is part of Department of Health and Human Services, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. 
a regional rep which covers um, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. Next. This is the uh, home web page.